to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't. <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Hi, Maya. Hi. How are you doing? Hi, love. I'm good. Good. How are you? Good. <clears throat> good. Yeah. Feeling you had that great. nice meditation. Oh, that was deep. So deep. Uh, we had an interesting start to our relationship, hey? We sure did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you explain. <laughs> not, I think I'm it's more go interesting. There. Well, we met on a dating app. It's true. And I think what was more interesting was like, <laughs> I was, I think we were both like, yeah, this will be cool. But you were, but you were like, I'll give him an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really, I really didn't think I was gonna drink the Kool Aid, but, <laughs> but I drank it. And what is the fucking Kool Aid then, Maya? If you want to bring it up that way, I had no idea what an incredible human you would be. Oh, thank you, love. Like it surpasses my knowing, <laughs> mm. truly. So it's interesting because you have this kind of 2D interaction. And I think we maybe spoke briefly on the phone or did we not? Did we just go and decide we were going to have dinner? No, I think we didn't even talk on the phone. No, just a couple of I texts. think just we went for it. And we're like, yeah, we'll have dinner. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Yeah. And then I remember seeing you at the, at the front of the restaurant and going like, oh, wow, it's already different. <laughs> Yeah, I felt that too. Yeah. Definitely. And then like 30 minutes in, I'm crying talking about my grandma. And I'm like, wow, this date is either going really well or it's going horribly. No, but I love that. I thought I like seeing a man in general be vulnerable, but coming from you was so unexpected just because I had this this image of who you were and I was I couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> I couldn't have been more wrong. And there I was sitting in front of you and I thought, oh my goodness. Oh yeah, he's crying. It's <laughs> happening 30 minutes into our date. But I, I loved it. And I and hope you remember. Like, just for, so people know, it's not like a usual <laughs> thing. It's not like my move, you know, where I'm like, here's yeah. my move. I it's talk like, about my grandma and I bring it up. You know, <laughs> There was one actress, an actor at the table. And that's you. That's your profession. I can't cry on command. I don't, yeah. got, I don't have that skill. But I think I just felt so safe and so Good. seen in that moment. Like, I was like, oh, well, I got this stuff. And well, I got this stuff. And I felt closer to you. And I was able to hold your hand. And, you know, we had just met. But already I was like, oh, I know him. I know mm. this person. Yeah. Yeah. And that started probably like the fastest escalation of any <laughs> relationship <laughs> that like Surely. I've ever been a part of. Same. You know, and I was in at that point the twilight of the twilight of the open relationship that I was in. Yeah. So I was, you know, ready to meet somebody in that point. And it was just very interesting how fast things started to go. I mean I mean <laughs> it was fast. It was like a it was a real ramp up. Yeah. It and was beautiful. It was, it was beautiful. real. It was yeah, real. For sure. For sure. And I think the acceleration was far faster than either of us were particularly ready for. No, I was not prepared. No, nor was I. Nor right. was I in a place for something to escalate like that. But I think to our credit, you know, we had our we had our relationship and people probably saw us posting some photos together from Sedona and Tulum sure. and different places and they could tell that we had some romantic connection going and we were also learning from each other in a lot of different ways. Like you had deeply embodied practices that I want to talk about, which I've continued to learn from you mm -hmm. and that you were able to share with the FFS community when you went down as a coach in Tulum. And there's a lot of beautiful things, but you know, that, that kind of, that ramp up was just, just a beautiful kind of experience. And then, yeah. but I think the other beautiful aspect of it is despite the the incredible ramp up and like the depth of feelings that we felt when we realized that there was an alignment because we moved so fast 
we very gracefully like transition. So gracefully. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> right? I mean, have you ever broken it off with someone so smoothly? I, know, <laughs> I don't think right? I have. Truly. No. And it was like this really graceful, like, like yeah. super high peak. And then like recognizing that we're out of alignment <laughs> and then like super smooth transition into a, just a deep friendship where yeah. we are now. It's amazing. That was I'm, pretty- I'm blown away by us. And, and that was like, I mean, we're talking like that, that happened over the course of maybe six months, five months, four, four months. I don't even know. I don't even I, know I how have no far. Idea. I have no idea. I didn't have a, I again, timeline. Yeah, I, mean, I don't have a timeline for it either. Yeah. But it, I mean, it's still going, you know, it's still like going. We're, we're. And the friendship that we have is actually continuing to deepen. Absolutely. Yeah. I look at you now and even still, I think I just brought it up. I, I love you so much more now just because there's so much more truth mm-hmm. to to our relationship right and we were talking about that earlier and it was like when you have all that pressure of expectation of what you want the relationship to Mm. be and what the relationship could be and all of this then you have fear totally i mean we had a contract we had a letter (laughs) (laughs) like of what we thought that this relationship would look like right and that's a lot of pressure that's a lot of pressure and, and it's kind of trying to like force reality right. into this thing that our and mind I will hold says. You to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's this thing that our mind says we want. Yeah. And we're like, yeah, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And then we're like, oh, fuck, we can't do this. Right. And then we were like, all right, well, we can't do this. And then we just were like, well, what can we do? Well, we can be like really dear friends. Yeah. And that's not the, that's not the model that, that's out there. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People, it's like the, your your ex, like anybody that you felt like that for. It's like people have to create a barrier of dislike, sure. and a barrier of judgment, right? That, to keep you from falling into some trap. Sure, and and just pure detachment. I've been in relationships where we were together for three years, and then all of a sudden it's just nothing, mm-hmm. death. And I mean, that's that's one way to keep moving forward, but you just love this person so much and yet you have to completely break all ties. And I understand that in some cases it's necessary, but you know, for us, it really wasn't. And right. which is strange in a way yeah. that that separation wasn't necessary. We, we didn't really have a break of sorts. Did we, we just, no, I mean, kept there going was, no, we just <laughs> kept going under yeah. a different, under just a different construct, which is a construct free of, it was a construct free of any idea of outcome mm-hmm. or any expectation. And yeah. we were just free to be, yeah. I mean, the, the sexual, the sexual connection was the thing that we just transitioned from really. But the intimacy was something that we've never had to transition from, right. which is, which is beautiful, which is, I think like really the way it should be, you know, like right. you can be like, all right, well let's do this. And then I get to talk to you about the, people that you're seeing yeah the guys you're seeing and also women yeah. <laughs> and I get to see you and and see you for all of you you expressing your truth with who you're seeing on your end and you know and now I can fully be present to that whereas when I was with you I I just didn't want to know right right I wanted to hide and just not face those facts that were right. happening right and it's so when you cross that barrier of of truth of like real truth there's like a freedom that just you get to just really let go and relax i think when we were in that meditation and in that place you know guided by muji it's one of my favorite meditations but in that place he encourages you to be the witness of the self which then takes you to a frame of identification where you're actually the unborn and the undying as he calls it yeah and then we got to see each other there and this is like, oh, yeah. That was so beautiful. Right. Right. And I think that's what we all crave is to like really fully be seen. Yeah. And I think that's what connected us at the beginning. I've never felt more seen. Mm-hmm. And because I was able to, for the first time maybe in my life, be truly honest, just because I know that, you know, a lot of my life, maybe most of my life, has been lived in lies and, you know, I've cheated. I've been, I've been all kinds of people just to mold into what I thought someone would want me to be. And there you were just accepting me as I am mm-hmm. for all of me. Yeah. And that, and that getting to that place for me too included an, 
an opening of the vest that didn't really it didn't allow the the construct of our relationship to actually exist in the way that it was then but now in this relationship where we have now you know when we first connected here today and you came over before the podcast it's like what's going on and it's like well this is exactly what's going <laughs> yeah. on you know yeah. it's just received without judgment because you don't have a vested interest in the outcome of what i'm doing you're no. just like none what's up <laughs> <laughs> like what's up yeah. what's up with you like what's yeah. going on and i think so many people say like oh yeah that my partner is my best friend and i i love that idea that you have a best friend that where you share it but what i end up seeing in reality is people hiding things and people like trying to be something yeah trying to be what the other person wants trying to show the person what they think they want and and all of these different and i've certainly been there yeah. i think we all have yeah for sure i think we all have so it's just cool to be able to have this on such a such a quick kind of like such a quick timeline and it just reframes yeah. really reframes for me and and something it's you know it's something that i've experienced before obviously with caitlin who you yeah. know really well right like yeah. we were engaged and now we're best friends Love and caitlin. um but i think it's important for the world to realize that maybe that's not the case with everybody because you have to have two people who are willing to meet at that level and sometimes you have to have a boundary and the boundary might be look this isn't working we're not on the same level of accord sure but if you find somebody who you are then like the more you can shed and the more constructs you can release and the more you can just be like here's truth then the more beautiful it's going to be and the more like full and fulfilling you're going to feel yeah absolutely (laughs) it's like you said it all yeah i agree (laughs) fully (laughs) yeah so one of the things that was really interesting and unique when i met you is you had had probably the most consistent gratitude practice of anybody i'd ever encountered like tell us tell us the maya before that what caused you to like engage with that practice and then the changes that you saw when you started doing it okay Well, I grew up a very anxious child (laughs) and yes, yeah. Oh yes. yes. And, um, suffered from, apparently I'm still an anxious child (laughs) in some parts of me. Yes. It definitely comes up, um, (laughs) came up recently actually, but, um, yeah, I, I definitely grew up very anxious and full of OCD and um, rituals and and things that I had to do to control myself and keep myself in those safe boundaries. And, you know, I was on medication for antidepressants, anti-anxiety, and I really despised myself. Like, I really did not like myself and I hated my family. I was a troubled teen, you know, I think a lot of us can relate maybe. what was the, what was now, now with your insight, I know this is skipping ahead a little bit, but when yeah. you look back, what was the, what was the, the cause of the part of you that despised yourself? Where did that come from? I really didn't feel seen. It's interesting because I remember very few bits of my past. I think we talked about this. There's, there's very little memories of me as a child because I I was not living in the present, basically. I was just somewhere else, I think. And Mm -hmm. I felt very unloved. I've discovered now that uh, my love language is words. And my parents are wonderful, but they never used words of affirmation or letting me know that I was loved. And nor did my sister, for that matter, quite, Mm -hmm. you know. And it's probably why I crave it so much now. Right. But yeah, I just, I, I think that was where it came from, obviously, from just growing up where I felt unseen and unheard. And I don't think I even wanted to be seen or heard. I mean, I was just so shy. And I just was like, as long as I'm hidden enough, as long as no one really sees well, me, I'll you, be okay. You cr- I think we all crave to be seen because to be seen is to be loved. You can't be loved unless right. you're seen. Like there's that story of Ramdas when when Maharaji, and it's a famous story, and the story is that Maharaji Neem Karoli Baba was able to see into Ramdas's thoughts and love him still with all of his thoughts. And yeah. that was the thing that unlocked him. 
he's like, wow, you have purview to all of my darkness, all of my shadows, all of my neuroses, all of my pathologies, all my selfishness, all my judgments, and you love me still. And I think we all crave to be genuinely seen and loved, but it's scary. Well, it's scary. I didn't want people to see me as who I really was. I wanted people to see me as this person that they wanted me to be, and I was good at it. I could make, especially in my teen years, I could make anyone not anyone, but people fall in love with me fairly easily because I could just mold and maybe why I'm an actor today, actually, Mm -hmm. but that felt easy. But to actually be seen for those sides of me that were darker or raging or... Right. Because there's an idea that if you were actually seen, who would love that? No. Who would love love that thing? (laughs) This monster. Who would love this monster? (laughs) nobody i'll show you this thing and you'll love this thing yeah but then you don't actually get to feel the love no and i think honestly with you was you were one of the first people i felt truly loved and that was special that is special yeah yeah to find people who see you and love you as you are right you know that's the that's it that's it with all the truth, all the... <laughs> all the shit and everything. And to love you just as you are, not what you could be, not you at your best day, not you at your most charming and your most beautiful, but you, you know, with your morning breath and with your, <laughs> with your OCD and with all your other things, like to be loved as that. And for me to be loved as myself and my own troubled, anxious, trying to be loved self, but to see the person trying. And love the person trying, not the person who's successful, but the person just behind it and be like, oh, sweetie, like I see you trying and it's beautiful too. And I have a question for you because you're such an example of truth. You know, you, you really are an openness and just, I mean, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to bring this up in the podcast, but you poop with the door open. (laughs) And to me, that is just like, wow, like he really... (laughs) puts himself out there <laughs> and just, you know, you swing and, and you hit the ball. Cause it's like, I, I, I love you back. Like I, it wasn't a, Oh my God. It was a, Whoa, interesting, <laughs> but also like, cool. I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's something that's like, it's uh, it's interesting because there's certain parts of the humanness, like all people shit. <laughs> You know, but girls in particular are shit ninjas, you know, like girl, like shit. And some guys are too. Like, I know a lot of guys who are like, they're going to like go make an excuse, give some yeah. other reason. Oh, yeah, they, they'll oh go I got to, you know, some people don't even like trip. to shit in public. They're like, oh, I got to run. I got some work to do. Really? They just got to take a <laughs> shit and they want to just shit in their house, you know? So it's just like this whole thing. Like, why are you leaving, man? We're having a great time. Like, ah, oh, fuck. I just got all this work. And really all they want to do is get the home toilet and just shit themselves <laughs> in their own piece yeah. and Instagram browsing no, and their I, own I, I, yeah. toilet. I, and you know? I, I more relate to you where it's like, just, just fucking do it. <laughs> just, just do it. You know. But the, the but. <laughs> I've always been envious of females who are shit ninjas. Maybe there's some men who are shit ninjas. I'm not a shit ninja. You so. are not. <laughs> a, I will concur a, to that. It's a, it's a process. Like girls can go in and then you think like, oh, they're just peeing. No, and you like company. <laughs> you just do. Peeing. And then you go to wash your hands in the same bathroom. Like, oh, they weren't peeing. They were not peeing. This was this was a shit ninja in effect, you know. And then you come out and you're like, "Yo, you didn't, you weren't going to pee. I can smell that. You think you're a shit ninja, but you left a trace. It's lingering in the air." And people were like, "No, why'd you go in there?" <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, this podcast went uh, in a different direction. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, I actually thought that like, all right, here's the difference. I got a hairy butthole. So I think girls, they normally shave their buttholes. And maybe the fact that I have to spend so much time wiping is because I have a hairy butthole. And I think, I, I think maybe the hairs <laughs> pull small <laughs> amounts of shit off as i'm going which makes it a much messier experience where wet wipes or like tushies or like like bidets or some other thing is necessary 
but girls, they can just like go in there. Not and they all wipe girls. One. Not all girls. Not all girls. I have had friends growing up that take a good 20 minutes. For sure. Yeah. No, I, I don't think it's a, maybe, you know, I don't think well, it's a okay. girl man. Like sometimes you got you to gotta shit and then you got to reload and then like you got a second, <laughs> you got a second drop that you got to make. I get that. That happens. That's, a, that's part of the bowel movement process. I'm just talking about the wipe. Like I talk, I talk to most <laughs> girls and they're like, yeah, I wipe just to check. But, you know, usually it's nothing. Yeah, I always got to wipe. I'd like, but how many times? I mean, it varies, but it's, it's... But sometimes you just wipe and you're like, good, Yeah, it's a, good for me, it's, it's always an easy process. I it's will a, tell you no, this. never an easy process it's for me. <laughs> so I shaved my butthole and I was like, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be able to be a shit ninja right now. You know what? Didn't help. My hypothesis that it had to do with the hairs? Nope. No. Nope. Not it. I don't know why. I can't going? explain it. Exactly. It's unknown. I'm maybe glad. I need, <laughs> maybe I need like I need like a toilet cam <laughs> to really actually understand the process. Go to Japan, <laughs> Japan. They have they have all the the process. They have the, can, the like, showers coming out of the toilet. I they know, have I the, love those those Toto toilets. Amazing. Yeah, that's <clears throat> everywhere. Actually, when I went to the darkness, that was one of my biggest concerns. Was right. I was like, look, I don't care really what the room looks like. I don't really care about this. But I tried to get. I sent one of the tushy bidets that could wash. <laughs> And, and I was like, let's just install this. That way I'll know. Mm -hmm. Cause like if you're in the darkness, what am I going to do? I can't look at the toilet paper. You're so gonna, what am I going to smell it? Am I going to like bring every wipe up and be like, am I done? <laughs> sniff, sniff. Like that sounded horrible. So I was like, yeah. I'm going to install this, but it wouldn't connect to the German plumbing. So I ended up having to take a shower after every time I went to the bathroom. Cause I was like, I don't know. That must've felt quite nice. I mean, it did, well, except for, all right, except for this one morning. Mm -hmm. So it was, I was eating raw vegan food Ooh. and which is actually really good for your bowel movements because you got a lot of fiber and like things are actually moving smooth, but, but I wasn't getting a lot of protein. There's not a lot of protein in the raw vegan diet. Cause I don't like eating a lot of beans and some of the things that you can eat. And I was eating a fair amount of nuts, but you're limited in the protein and they didn't have like a lot of fancy proteins or shakes that I was getting, but they did have coconut oil. So I was like, well, just make me some coconut oil smoothies. And so they did. And one morning they made me two coconut oil smoothies. And then I was like, oh, that's a lot of fat, but I'll, I'll be all right. So I just crushed these two protein, these two coconut oil smoothies. And I was just shitting all day. <laughs> In the dark. In the dark, which meant I was showering all day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how dark are we talking? I think we talked about this. It's but like absolute, black. absolute blinding black. Right. Like where there is not a distinction between the light. I mean, the missing the period. toilet at this point would be devastating. Oh, then anything, anything that you, anything, any mess you make, any door you leave open, anything that happens like that, like it's a hazard. Like you got it. And you it's all in mindful. one room. So the smells, I'm sure, between the food and the, you know, I, I'm just thinking. Yeah, it's, yeah, there is some of that. Yeah. yeah. You got to kind of cope with that. And it was fine on like a normal routine where I poop twice a day. But on the on the double coconut oil smoothie day, where it was Oof. like I had to shit Rough. six times. And then I had to shower six times. I was like, that consumed like a good portion of my day. Like, I get it. Here I am in the fucking shower again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's, there's that. There's that. I'm glad we, we <laughs> talked about poop for half the podcast. That's, that's, that's awesome. That's not where I saw this going. <laughs> talking <laughs> shit. Talking, talking shit, shit with Maya Stoyan. <laughs> the title of the, the, the title of the podcast. Of course this would happen. Okay. So anyways, going back to the original point that we got on this tangent from was loving yourself as you are with all your shit, literal and <clears throat> I brought it up to metaphorical. be fair. It's my, yeah. Literal and metaphorical, mm -hmm. being comfortable with your shit. And I, don't, I think most of us aren't comfortable. So you were in that, that, common, that common position where you weren't feeling like you're, you with all your shit was worthy of being loved. So you had no. to portray some other avatar, some other version of you. Absolutely. And I just, I, I was craving this validation, this attention. I mean, there were times where, you know, in my teen years, I was dating maybe four or five people at the same time, but obviously none of them would ever find out or ever know about each other. And, you know, that was my way of coping with how empty I felt. Yeah. Truly. So the external validation sources of love. Well, this person loves me. This person right. loves me. This person loves me. And I was different me, people with all of them. I mean, it wasn't even, I, I had no idea of who I was. Mm-hmm. 
no idea. So just Probably. trying to fill that, fill that void with the totally. external love that you That's can all get I could do. That I had no tools. Yeah. Zero. Yeah, that, that lasted for me until like, oh, I don't know, maybe now still <laughs> <for> currently. <laughs> you know, like that's a big part of even when I was doing, you know, I attempted that celibacy thing where I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I'm going for six months. That's my goal. Lasted nine days, but it was a solid beautiful night. <laughs> solid. solid. <laughs> Embarrassing effort. But but it was perfect because then I really realized that even at that point with all the work I'd done, I was still relying so heavily on the external validation of other people loving me yeah. that it exposed the fact that I didn't really love myself. So that's what started me on my self-love practice. That's what, and then, you know, through this magical synchronicity of getting Kamal Ravikant's book and then being able to meet him and go on a podcast, it all kind of lined up perfectly. And that's like a clear line of demarcation for me where I recognize, okay, here's major overriding problem. The foundation of self-love is missing for me. So now I have to apply the solution. Mm -hmm. But your solution came a little bit different. Your solution came through the gratitude practice. Well, it started off with transcendental meditation that came okay. into my so that life. Was first. That was first. And I started meditating twice a day, every day for 20 minutes. I still do till this day. It was probably 10 years ago at this point. And that really triggered something in me, just sitting with myself and trying, you know, slowly figuring out who I really was. And well, Tia is not exactly sitting with yourself because you're chanting. Right? Like, I mean, you have a mantra, but you are sitting with yourself. You have a true. mantra. That's it. True. And so your thoughts come through. Mm -hmm. And once you realize that your thoughts are there and that you're meditating, you're like, ooh, mantra. Go back to your mantra. So I've never done it. And for, for people who haven't done TM meditation, you're supposed to get the mantra from... A teacher. A teacher. Yeah. So, so like you so have, I so there teach is, you how so to... So there is like a bear, and I still I still disagree with that premise. I, I know. Feel, I feel like you could teach me and you could just tell me to chant something and it would work. I cannot. <laughs> I cannot. But I don't know. I know. I you've been, I you are very insistent that I teach you I was TM. Like, and I was just like, teach me. I, just give bro, me one, I don't just, have the tools. Just give me one of these it. things. I, I won't even know what it means anyways. You could be like fucking satsang, shiva, fucking I'm living in truth. ram das, palooza. I, I, and I would know, be like, I'm actually... satsang, shiva, ram das, palooza. And I would have been like fucking, I would have been off and running. And I could be a full TM meditator. I really believe that still. But I don't know. I'm truly proud of myself for not <laughs> going with it and actually giving you a bullshit mantra <laughs> and just going through it and just your whole life just having this mantra that I gave you. So, no, staying in integrity. And I'm going to yes, start chanting Satsang Shiva Ram Das Palooza. And then, I, that was beautiful. And then I'm going to see if it works and then we'll, then we'll decide. All right, but anyway, so you get this mantra. And so you then, get this mantra and uh, the story that they the, the teachers talk about it's not my story but it's basically just you you have this vision of our thoughts being the ocean right and mm -hmm. basically what the mantra does it helps you go deep within the ocean so your thoughts are just all up here and you right. go you know you while you meditate obviously you're bound to be thinking like oh what am i gonna get at course, the grocery thoughts, store thoughts or whatever constant chatter and especially when something traumatic is happening you know you want to avoid meditation like the plague but it, it that's when all the magic happens especially with tm because you can count on that mantra to sort of get you deep on yeah. a deeper level you made a really good point there is that when we're resistant towards something that's our compass yeah that is absolutely our compass that is pointing towards the oh thing gosh. that we need that we need, that we to, need do. to do i can't tell you the amount of times in those 20 minute practices that i always want to end at like 16 minutes i'm like i've done enough i've got shit to do i gotta i gotta get going with my life and it's 16 minutes i'm like i've done enough like i'm good but it was once i started actually following through with the full 20 minutes that the magic happened in those last four mm -hmm. because i was able to just be like i can't yeah. believe i gotta do this and then just releasing that and then finding that moment of presence and deep awareness. Yeah. Like when Joe Dispenza, the first person who taught me about gratitude. When he... <laughs> I'm done with you. 
this is a running joke between us because <laughs> Joe Dispenza was talking about a lot of the things that Maya was talking to me about, and she was there for the podcast that I did with him. So I was like, finally, someone's telling me the virtue of gratitude. She's like, you son of a bitch. I've been telling you this shit for months. And I was like, huh, praise Joe Dispenza. Praise Joe Dispenza for all that he's taught me. And you're like, yeah, yeah, good job, buddy. Yeah, good, good, good for you. Mm -hmm. You and Joe. You and Joe. I was Go looking on. at you like this. I was like, this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he says, you know, he says you come up against yourself. In any meditation, you come up against yourself. Yep. And that's like a part of it. And to know that, as you said, like the value comes when you move past the point where you come up against yourself. Yeah. It's like looking for, there's, there's so many easy routes, right? And I think that's where gratitude comes in because gratitude did not necessarily come easy to me, right? It's not something that I want to do. And I, it's so easy to kind of be pessimistic in a way or, you know, go down that rabbit hole of like, life sucks, people suck. But it was when I actually started off with this book called The Magic by Rhonda Byrne, which I've shown you, I have like mm -hmm. five copies. And I started doing the practice and I noticed even within the first three or four days, just my whole body changed. And uh, it, was, it was just this transformation that just happened even within a couple weeks. And then by the end of the practice, which is 28 days, magic happened. I can't even tell you, just everything started falling into place. And it was that quick of a change. And I remember actually after the first practice, I took a break, like a long break, and my life quickly went back to shit. <laughs> it, it really did. It was, it's not something that is sustainable unless you practice it every day. Mm -hmm. And that's what people, I think, they think they can do a certain thing for a certain amount of time and that'll stay with them, right? And, and I it, am the fucking king of that. You know, because uh, even something, concur with even, that, but. <laughs> even as something as powerful as the darkness retreat, right? You know, like I pull my, and I showed you the video and eventually people will see the video, but I pull my blindfold off and I'm just weeping with this gra gratitude for sight and this realization of how beautiful my life is and how beautiful the world is. And then, you know, fast forward a week, I'm looking out in the sunset, like, yeah, nice fucking sunset, but I got shit to do. And I'm like, what? Come on, man. It's only a week ago. But yeah. like, the thing about these experiences, is they'll give you a, a Satori, this glimpse at how you can orient yourself to life. But it's hard. You can't really practice the darkness retreat every day. You can't practice the ayahuasca every day. You can't practice these, these transformational experiences all the time, which are reliable ways to get there. But you need the daily, you need the daily work yeah. to keep it. But those are the practices. Those That's are... It where the darkness may come, where the light may come. And I mean, I'm the queen of practices. I, I'm OCD. So that, that was the whole point is that, you know, my OCD, I w it would take me two hours to go to bed when I was younger, just tons of rituals and, and things to keep me safe. And now I've transformed my OCD into practices. Mm -hmm. And so I've made this, this thing that was my weakness, my superpower in a way. And so just having that to rely on every day is it's magic, you yeah. know? So tell us what, so give us a flavor of what some of these practices are like. Like if you're practicing gratitude, what does it look like? And at the end, I think giving people a taste, just leaving them through, because in Tulum you led people through a beautiful exercise and it was 10 different things. Maybe we'll do one for people listening at the end, but that's kind of your own, and maybe it is part of your part of your practice exactly, but... Lead us through some of the examples of like what the gratitude practice for you is like. And I know it shifts every day, but just, you know, pick a, pick sure. a sampling. Um, <clears throat> for the last, so now it's almost eight years. Every day I will write a list of 10 things that I'm grateful for. And it's not just writing them down. It's explaining why I'm grateful for them. So if you can do the math, eight, almost eight years of every day counting what you're grateful for you have to get real creative because you're not repeating yourself necessarily, but you can be grateful for an eyelash. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and then trying to figure out a way to interpret why you're grateful for that specific thing. And that's where your gratitude goes deeper. Because mm -hmm. I can be grateful for the sun, you know, but 
realizing why I'm grateful for that sun, what it brings to me. And just, you know, it can take, it doesn't have to take an hour to do this. It can take five minutes. It, it really, it, it just has to flow out of you. And once you get into the practice, that will flow out of you. So that's one practice that I do every day. And then there's the book, The Magic by Rhonda Byrne, that has 28 practices. I've made them my own after the, uh, after now I'm on my 58th round. Yeah. So basically it'll take you through a journey of being grateful for different aspects of your life. So whether it be your health, your relationships, your finance, your success in your career. And every day it just brings you closer to basically living the life that you want to leave that you, that you want to not leave, live. Ooh. Both. But yeah. Both. Yeah. Now the, one of the key parts of this is not just to write it, but you got to feel it. That's, Absolutely. That's where the, that's where, you know, that's where it really starts to right. happen because the feelings are the thing that actually translate thought to reality within the body. A hundred percent. And you saw the practice that I did in Tulum. It's just getting in. I'm, there are so many times when I practice gratitude where it it brings me to tears because I'm there and just knowing that I'm living the life that I've always wanted to live at this point, especially starting off at a place where I never in my wildest dreams thought that my life would be this amazing, you know, and, and just being here sitting with you right now, it's just, I could have never imagined that, but yet there must have been a part of me that knew I, I, I could do this. I, I can live a life where I'm happy, mm-hmm. where I'm content with myself and, and being of service. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? One of the really beautiful parts about the practice that you had us, you led us through was being grateful for not only things that are in manifest now, but grateful for things that have not yet manifested and be grateful for them as if they have already as happened. As if they have already happened. <laughs> right. So like even if you're in a place where you're really ostensibly not happy with where you are and you're not in the place where you want to be, you can be grateful for the life where you are happy. Absolutely. And you can feel that in your body. Mm-hmm. You can already be present to what is about to happen. And, and that's still being present. People always say, well, you know, then you're anticipating and and you don't want to have any attachment to anything. I'm not anticipating anything. I'm it living it. Happened. Yes. It's happened. Yes. It's, happening. it's It's an interesting, you know, I sometimes joke about being brainwashed into gratitude because when you practice it that often every day, you sort of are. Anything that happens in your life, <laughs> sort of what I said to you, you had a, a bit of a moment today and I was like, that's the greatest blessing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because it is, you can turn anything into gold at that point. And so... Even if you're going through something in your life and you're f- feel, you feel like you're really far from where you want to be, you can totally bring that to your life in the present if you really just sit with it, imagine it. I mean, imagination is the true magic carpet ride, right? Mm-hmm. You can imagine just about anything. And if you work on your imagination, that's where the gold happens. Mm. I really believe that. You know, that. it's interesting as you talk about this because... I know enough and I talk about using hindsight as foresight, right? And I know this in my brain. And in my brain, I can realize that if I look back on my life, I'm grateful for everything. I'm grateful for all the things that at the time seemed like this is the fuck, this is a fucking disaster. But I've, I've gotten that mental, at least the mental pattern of being like, no, no, at some point I'm going to be grateful for this because look, I'm batting a thousand where I'm grateful for everything that's happened. So I know that I'm going to be grateful for the next thing that happened, but I don't necessarily feel it. You know what I mean? Like even let's take my car accident. I popped out of my car accident like immediately when I came to and I was like, huh, that sucked. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to be grateful for this. I just don't know why yet. But I didn't feel grateful. I just knew it, you know, and like this thing that you've been mentioning that I've been going through today is like, I can cognitively get there where I'm like, yeah, I'll be grateful for that. And I'll be grateful for this and I'll be grateful for that. But it's different when you feel it because that's when the alchemy starts to happen. That's when you actually start to turn it. So it's like the difference between knowing with your mind and then knowing with your emotions. And it's interesting because there's a fine line between tricking your body and actually being there. Do you know what I mean? 
I've I've gone through situations where obviously I'm not going to say hooray that's awesome. <laughs> you know, I as you have you to know, feel what you feel. You have to feel what you feel and and that's the thing. Sometimes when people find out about me doing this practice so often they they're like, "Oh, she probably has no emotions." I cry all the time. I get angry. I I get all the feels, but it's about feeling those emotions and then being able to transition to gratitude mm-hmm. and taking the time that it takes. You don't want to rush the process of being angry. As I told you, I was a hulk a few days ago. Um and and that and that's okay, but yeah. I was able to transition it. You won't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> so exactly. My, uh... exactly, but I I was able to transition so quickly and even while I was so angry, I could throw something. I still was in awareness of like, "Ooh, this is ugly. This is not good." But at the same time, you know, I was like, Okay, well, just go with it because that's what you're feeling. Yeah. And I'm not going to cover that up. I'm 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 feeling the feels and just being able to then be like, okay, well, calm, chill, you know, chill out and chill the fuck out. Chill the fuck out. <laughs> and take those moments to breathe and then maybe 10 minutes after I was already thinking of all the reasons why I was grateful that this had happened, that this was meant to happen this way. And then I called the person and I was like, I love you. I'm sorry. This triggered me. I know exactly what I did. I reverted back to Maya at 11 years old. Mm-hmm. And but but it's it's quick, it's fast because that practice keeps you in check. Yeah. Yeah, I, I and I think the the effect that you know, the effect that it has is when I met you, it wasn't just your gratitude practice. I knew that you were practicing it and you would lead me through some of them and I would get a taste of it, but it's something that grows. You get better at it. Like anything practice makes the master. But what I was able to patently see is I would do something for you. You know, we're in a relationship. I'd buy you something or do something sweet for you. And (laughs) yeah, I would do something sweet for you. And the amount of gratitude that would pour out of you was like, I was like, whoa. Well, I have, to be fair, never been this showered with <laughs> gifts and love in my entire life. So. See, there it is again. You know, and that's, and that's like, it's such a beautiful thing. It's such a beautiful gift. Like people, people think, and it's something that Mark Manson talks about, like you give somebody something and it creates an inherently moral gap. And it, he calls it a moral gap. And it's the gap is the feeling like, well, I need to give something back to that person. You know, they've done something for me. I need to give something back to that person. But really, the only thing you need to give back is your gratitude. That's the most precious thing you can give back. If you really give them back gratitude all the way, that's going to fill that person more than buying them the same thing. It's not like I bought you this necklace. Now I need to buy you a necklace or I need to buy you something of the same thing. Like, no, that's not what you want. You just want the gratitude to come back. Well, and that's the magic of gratitude is, is the more you show gratitude, the more you will receive. Do you know what I mean? Like people Mm. are so much more willing to give you if you are fully receiving it and acknowledging it with all your heart and really feeling just gratitude for it. And, and maybe why you kept showering me with gifts. <laughs> that was not my intention. But still, you know, that's, that's sort of what happens when you are grateful, when you're grateful for the career that you have. All of a sudden, work started pouring my way because all of a sudden I realized, like, I am so in love with what I do, mm-hmm. truly in love. And I have zero to complain about. I, I used to complain about everything. I used to feel the rejection, the constantly, like, just battling with no's you know, from audition to audition or whatever it was that I was working on. And then all of a sudden I was like, wow, I'm so lucky to even be here in LA. I come from Switzerland in the middle of nowhere. And now here I am in Hollywood and meeting incredible people. And it it just sort of like, you realize like, oh, my life is amazing just as it is. Mm -hmm. And I had nothing at the time. It's not like I had any credits or, you know, but it just transforms you who you are you have when you go to these auditions and you meet with people they have to kind of look at you like who what what (laughs) what is this thing that just walked in the door (laughs) like who is this who is this alien (laughs) that just came here because that's that's not the normal mode of being you know for for most of us probably particularly in your field i'm not well versed in the actor field so i don't so i don't know but i know that in general 
you're you're alien to what well i love auditioning now that's the thing like in the last five six years i've i really enjoy it i get I, i get to perform i get to do what i love and a lot of actors i think see it as something that they're dreading to do because it's to get the job right but i look at it as i audition as if i already have the job Mm-hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, the the hardest part for me auditioning was always seeing the other beautiful women in the room f- with me. You know, that was challenging. I was always thinking like, oh, they're so much prettier. They, they're probably way more talented. They probably have way more experience. And now just having gratitude with me, I just look at them and I'm like, I really hope they do an amazing job. I really do like genuinely feel that. And that took time. Mm-hmm. That for me to transition that and transform that. But now I, I really look at them and I'm almost just like sending them love and courage and joy. And It's the difference between being in scarcity or being in abundance. Yeah, the gratitude, there's room for everyone. The gratitude is filling you up so much yeah. that you have an abundance that if somebody else takes takes your job, in quotes. It was never for me. It was never meant for me. If, it, if they take your job, that's okay because your job wasn't what made you full in the first place. You're still no. full. And if you're going you can... to go home full. You're going to spend the next week full and you're going to spend the next week full. Right. And you can turn that into relationships. And I think that's that's the whole point. It's not finding someone that will complete you, but finding someone that really sees you just as you are and accepts you and you can just be whole and full and live your life and thrive without this, this need, you know? Yeah. What still hooks you? What still hooks you? What still keeps you from being fully free? What are the things that, that still at this point after eight years Mm. of largely in an uninterrupted practice and all the work that you've done, what, what still hooks you? It's definitely this this need for perfection that is that I'm never going to attain, obviously. But I, I think, you know, the reason why I still get down on myself or angry at myself is that if I don't do something perfectly. And I'm getting better at it for sure. But even when I look at just how meticulous I am, how dedicated dedicated I am to practices, to diets, to, you know, having a certain image and and I want to throw that all away and I as I said you've helped that so you've helped that in more ways than I can explain just in accepting me as I am I already feel more free I already feel like I don't need to be perfect I'm not and that's okay and you know you gave me the courage to come out to my parents last year as being bisexual. And that was just so huge and so scary. It's scary even now, but I feel more free and that is who I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that I can be honest with it. And, and the response towards it has been nothing but love. Truly. I mean, shocking to some or you know, especially just, I come from a fairly conservative family. So just even, even that, just being terrified that they wouldn't love me anymore, but they did, you know? And I think same with certain practices. I feel like, well, if I don't do it perfectly, well, what will happen, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I, te- I test myself. I actually do. I sometimes just take little breaks and I'm like, how well am I doing? Oh, um, but I, I always go back to it because why would I want a life where I'm not feeling this amazing, this incredible? And that is my truth. That is who I am. A lot of people will tell me, well, you've changed so much. You're so different. And I'm like, I'm glad I've changed. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm so glad I didn't it's love funny, myself. It's the funniest insult of all insults. Right, right. You've changed. Right. No shit, buddy. <laughs> like, well, well, people. Like, I better. It was just I, I. I heard this recently, as someone saying, like, it's supposed to be taken as a compliment when you say you haven't changed a bit. It's like, well, I hope I have. Like, yeah. I didn't really like the person who I, you know, and of course I've changed. Like, it, it's supposed to be a compliment based on looks, right? Well, you still you still look so young and you're still just but at the same time I feel like the greatest compliment would be yes you've changed it's amazing it's so great 
well done. Mm. You yeah, know? consistency is a trap. Totally. You know, because if you get known as, I remember back in my days where I used to party. And when I would party, and I still party every once in a while. Let's not say I'm not done with partying, but it's definitely slowed down, you know, a lot. But at the point where I was partying a lot, when I would get ramped up to party, I was like, I was putting out an enormous amount of energy. I was standing on tables, dancing. I was like providing like a huge amount of energy that was a contagious energy that was like bringing the whole party like further alive. And people would catch it and be like, fuck, we're fucking getting it. Like, this is a party <laughs> now. Like, this is, it's on. Obviously, yeah. on the table. He's fucking <laughs> dancing. He's like taking his shirt off. He's giving lap dances to strangers. He's fucking going for it. Right. You know, like, we're partying. <laughs> And then I remember, you know, some days I would go out there and I would just want to relax. And like, I didn't have the energy for that. And I just want to like hang. But I would have so many people come up to me and be like, what's wrong, man? Like, what's wrong? Like expecting me to be a certain way. And it's like, for sure. do that thing. Do, do the thing that you always do where you put out all that energy and you dance on the table. And I'd be like, and I would get stuck in it. I'm like, okay, yeah. fine. Like, uh, um, more shots of tequila, please. Like, right. you know, is there some drugs? And anybody have some drugs? <laughs> you know, like, what? Do, I'll do what you. I'll, and I would do it because yeah. I was like, that's what it, that was what was expected of, of me. Of course, was to to be that. You know, to be that consistent thing oh. where everybody was like, no, this is what Aubrey does. But totally. that's like one example. But we do that in our life all the time. Like where. You know, if people expect us to be the happy, bubbly person and we go to see that and we're not happy and bubbly that day, we can put on that fake happy, bubbly, but we're going to feel like shit. And then it's going to be this weird thing where we don't enjoy it. Right. And it's not even in your case about being happy or bubbly. Perhaps you were very happy and content just sitting totally. there doing nothing. Totally. I mean, people love drunk Maya. Drunk Maya is fun. <laughs> but, you know, I took a whole year sober that one year, not last year, but the year before. And... It was wild, the, it, the offense that people took towards me not drinking. And I was just like, but, but this is a healthy choice. <laughs> I don't love myself while I'm drinking and being self-destructive or, or, you know, puking in the middle of, of a kitchen somewhere. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So like, I fucking love it when I'm holding Maya's hair back and she's just giving it hell in the bathroom. That right. makes me happy. So it's that thing where people think that like oh she's really going down a weird path of like no drinking practicing gratitude meditating and going to church like all these things and it's like wait wait but isn't that all really healthy and good and and I'm happier and I'm smiling a lot more and you know and same with you maybe sitting at that club just like chilling and not doing drugs mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to trying to just be chill and be in the moment but people were like you gotta. Yeah. Yeah. And I think avoiding that temptation to fall and slip into your consistency and just to be true, be true to what is and then surround yourself with people who see you and then will know and then will be, will love you for whatever is appearing at yeah. that, you know, at that moment love yeah. you for your truth, which then will allow you to actually move through whatever thing you are and find the equilibrium wherever that equilibrium lies. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's the, that's the journey of authenticity. It's just like really letting all that go, like letting the trying go. And I'm like the things that you're talking about, I mean, that's something that I've really had to sit with too. That was something in the darkness. It's that, I, that really came up was, and it was actually precipitated by a friend who, you know, someone who I really, really, <clears throat> You know, I really like this. I mean, now we're really close friends. But when we first met, he didn't have a positive impression of me. And I was bummed to hear it. But, you know, and some of that was his own projection. Some of that was his own way that he was walled off. But some of it was also when I really looked, it was like, well, I really wanted this guy to like me from the drop. Right. So I was trying. Like, I wasn't fully authentically comfortable with the fact like maybe you'll like me maybe you won't this is me yeah you know i was like pushing a little bit a little bit harder you know not being particularly deceptive but just pushing pushing myself into an aspect of expression that wasn't in full authenticity so i got to sit with that and i was like hey man thanks because like that was subtle you know and you maybe added a little bit to that and, and he and he owned that he's like yeah for sure 
you know, like I definitely had my own part of that, but I also contributed to that too. Yeah. And so trying to really meditate on like what that expression is that's free of the trying. And it's so interesting because to me, and it's so funny, I met you and I, I, I gave the joke, I, I thought I wasn't going to drink the Kool-Aid, but, and just how wrong I was in, I feel like you are the most authentic person I know. And you are so in truth and you are here because you want to help people genuinely. And I see that so clearly. And it's so interesting to me that you still, you know, struggle at times with feeling, you know, do people see me a certain way or do they not? And, and because you, you have that confidence and that air that comes with you, but just your heart is so vast Mm -hmm. and is so pure and, and, and in truth. And there's, we have, we have layers, right? We were talking about depth and we all have layers of who we are. And I think, you know, you saying you pushed a little extra hard with this person. It's like, well, that that's not necessarily inauthentic. That's, that's a part of you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting because that is a, that is a part of me, but it's also a part of me that I can drop. Oh, absolutely! You, know? you can and let go of that. You can, and it's a part that's like, and it's uh, I think the right response to seeing somebody who's trying, like we said before, you know, which is what you wanted when oh, you were I've young. I've been trying. Mm, what yeah. you what you really want is someone to see the trying and love you still, not judge you for trying, but right. like, see, oh, I see you trying. But I love you still because I and see you, the person that's trying. Totally. The person that's trying is is worthy of love too. Like disregard all the trying. I'm not going to hold that in judgment. Right. You know, like I see the trying, but I still love, I love the person, the one that is trying. And you know that feeling when you're trying and you know that that person can see that you're trying. <laughs> like it happens with me sometimes when I meet people that I feel like that I'm kind of putting a, a slightly on a pedestal that I'm like, whoa. And I'll just be like extra trying and they're not. They're like, you're cool, (laughs) you're good. And you can tell, but there's this whole, like, no one talks about it. Mm. And, and it's like, well, it's a real, it's a real thing where you're, you're just adding on a layer to you. And in my case, like I'll throw in a little white lie to just make myself (laughs) seem cooler and it's unnecessary. Yeah. And it causes stress and anxiety because as soon as you have to start thinking about what you should do rather than just being who you are, it's like you're like worried if you're doing it right. I'm just now discovering who I am and I'm like, whoa, there's so much, there's so much going on in there. And, you know, I can be all of it and I can be none of it. Yeah. I think one of the advantages that we both had when we met was I was just coming off the night before I had a really great date. I actually, <laughs> actually, right. And when I you had, told me that, I was like, great, what am I, I like, doing here? I had like a really great date and I was like riding high. I was like, <laughs> I had a fucking amazing date and I'm going to see Maya. We've, we texted a few times, you know, like whatever. Like I was already, it was, I was so like free of any expectation or any need of this thing to be right. a certain way. And you had, you know, your own people who you were seeing, you were still, yeah. you were still romantically involved with other people that had you know, really rich, you know, like kind of rich relationships with. So you didn't have like a lot of expectation. No, so we zero. Came, so we literally came zero. And like neither one of us felt a particularly strong urge to create an outcome. And I think that also like let us come in without our guard up where we're like, oh, hey, you, oh, you. Oh, yeah. wow. And so we started from a place where, because usually that first day you're thinking about trying. Like, No, and I was actually I fully look? myself I... from the get-go. That right. was interesting. Yeah. yeah. Like, how do I look? What am I going to say? How's this going to be? Oh, I wonder if we're not going to be able to talk. We're like, yeah, fuck it. If it doesn't work, whatever. You I'm were coming. crying. I was, <laughs> I don't know what I was doing, but yeah, I probably had a zit on my face. <laughs> Who knows? But yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think, uh, <clears throat> to try and get ourselves to that, to that state where we just trust just trust that we can be and that the outcome like we get trapped by by what we want you know if we really want something and we're afraid of it not happening then we're, then that's when the trying is really right. going to ramp up and and that's a question to you is you know you said you have a hard time feeling but is there a healthy sense of detachment in a way do you feel because 
you know, so many people are attached to an outcome, attached to, if I get this, then my life will be a mm -hmm. certain way. And perhaps you not feeling things as much, and I've seen you feel, obviously, I've seen you cry a bunch, but yep. um, the, the, the lack of sort of like excitement or, uh, you know, in, in envisioning where you want to be, maybe that's just a healthy way of thinking like, well, if it happens, it happens, you know, but it's actually, I think an unhealthy way because I think actually it is, it is, it's a forced detachment mm. because I'm afraid, mm. I'm afraid of being attached. I'm afraid of what I'll think of myself. If this doesn't work, I'm afraid if my business fails, I'm afraid if this person doesn't like me. So if I can just pretend like, Oh, nah, I love the honesty. Yeah. Like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. And that's, you know, something that started to peel away as I've been doing this work recently is like recognizing that I'd had a little layer, a little filter where it didn't fully let love in. It didn't fully let happiness in. It didn't let my excitement in, but it also didn't let it out, you know, cause it was just holding me in this safe place of detachment, but it was a false place of detachment. It was a place of armor, you know, where the, where the armor was up and it was permeable armor so some would get in some would get out occasionally the armor would melt and i would have an outburst and when the armor melts the unblinding happens and the tears flow as a way to kind of wash clean that thing and so i'm in this state but the place where i want to get to is a place where i embrace the fact that i'm going to be attached I embrace the fact that life is so good that it's going to be hard to let it go, that I love my mom so much that when she dies, it's going to really hurt. The other option is I could pretend like, yeah, I love my mom and, you know, no one ever leaves and no one ever really dies and right. I'll be fine. And that's like a safe place, but that's a place where I'm not really letting myself feel like how much that's going to hurt because it's how good it fucking feels now. Do you feel that that's also what led you to having multiple partners and not being in a monogamous relationship? Just that fear of having that one deep connection and that one love. Yeah, where it's a diversification of attachment for sure. I mean, that's definitely an aspect of it. Like, okay, well, I got multiple, I got multiple horses in the race. So if this one pulls up lame, you know, of course, well, that's how goes, I felt too. This yeah. one goes to the glue factory. No worries. <laughs> You know, like I got, I got, I can hop on horse number 12 and, you know, we can still run the derby. You know what I mean? Like I don't got to have all my eggs in this one basket. Sure. So for sure, that was an aspect of it. I think the primary aspect of it was that hunger. Like you said, when you're younger, the hunger for multiple, multiple points of validation, it's feeding yeah. a hungry ghost that's saying, I don't love myself enough, but if enough of these people love me, I can look at them and I can count them and I can be like goddamn Scrooge McDuck diving in my gold right. pieces <laughs> of women who love me and yeah. swimming around and being like, look at me, I'm wealthy. I got this beautiful person and this beautiful person and this beautiful person. They love me. So I am worthy of love. Sure. You know? But it was never enough. Like Scrooge is an archetype because totally. no matter how much his coffers were full, and no matter how much gold he had, there was never enough gold because it never actually fills you. The external can never actually fill the internal. So you just keep growing in this kind of like yeah. this thing. And it was it was the insatiable desire of the ego to, you know, try and solve the problem of the emptiness inside, but it's solving it with the wrong solution. Yeah. But I already see so much change and transformation sure. within you. Sure. It's a process. It's a journey, it right? I'm in I'm, I'm on my journey of truth and authenticity and boy, is it not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like to you it comes very easy to me. It <laughs> <laughs> I mean the truth part in some ways you're very, some, you're very I've practiced that yeah, more but you you have a way of being not self-deprecating but you can you can be humble about you know the way you've kind of just yeah. but but you 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 are able to now just speak your truth very quite simply I would say for the most part for the most part but then there's then there's special situations that are hard right and you know when i was in the darkness i was grappling with two particular special situations and it's too personal to actually share because it involves other people and that's not my yeah. business to share things that involve other people but there was two particularly special people in which 
I recognized that there was still a lot of still a lot of fear, mm. still a lot of fear of them yeah. not loving me, not approving of me, not you know, not actually. And so a lot of the karmic chewing where I was just gnawing on my own emotions and my own stuff was focused on you know particular individuals and like a lot of the growth happened when I was able to really chew through both of those specific situations where I was still getting hooked you know what I mean and where truth was whereas it's like really easy for us now to be in this like radical effortless truth where it just kind of flows out and where it's easy when I'm sitting with Kyle and yeah. like, you know, and like we're sharing yeah. it or even Aaron, yeah. you know, like, which by the way, we had the most hilarious dinner of all time with me, you, Kyle and Aaron. That, that, oh boy. That, that one night. That was, that was the, that was the most, one of the most ridiculous and funny nights of my life. But with all them, it's like. <laughs> it really was ridiculous but and amazing. All, but with all of them. And it wasn't sex, everybody. Relax. This wasn't, <laughs> yeah, please, this wasn't a giant orgy between me, Kyle, Aaron, and Maya. So, but it was just a funny night. But with with people like that, like it's really easy for me to be truthful. Yeah. You know, because I trust that no matter what I say, it's gonna be a laugh. And they trust the same thing. Like we can all talk about shitting our pants Gosh. or doing whatever, like whatever the fuck is going on. Yeah. We just talk about it and we like either have a chuckle or a hug or whatever the thing is is necessary and it's easy and and we're in that state too but in in the relationships where i'm still afraid and still wanting still wanting to get some kind of result Mm -hmm. well that's where that's where the constrictions come in right it's because you're looking for a result i'm looking for a result Mm -hmm. yeah so you know in a way like in a way now having kind of really charged used it as a compass like we said earlier like the compass was okay these particular relationships are the relationships in which i'm still getting hooked i'm still trying i'm still i'm still fearful so one and i think the conventional wisdom is we'll just get rid of those relationships push those aside which is the same path of renunciation of a monk saying like ah the world is too much it hooks me i'm going to go to this monastery and everything is going to be insulated i'm going to get rid of everything you know and i've been talking to you know i talked to ragu marcus who you got to meet and we talked about and and really looking at the path of renunciation and it is a way to in, in, like insulate you you know at a certain point if i divorced myself from these challenging relationships i would have been okay but it would have been a false sense of okay right. because i would have never actually charged towards them until i could release them use them as a tool <laughs> to pry open this deeper layer of wanting something when it really mattered yeah it mattered to my head you know so reframing that and to like actually go through those i think that's probably the thing that's given me the most benefit is just using those challenging relationships as a compass and actually leaning into them rather than leaning away from them not leaning into them with with craving but leaning into them with like this is mine to chew on this is my work to do and i'm and i'm going to do this work until i can love them as they are and divorce divorce myself from the outcome and the attachment to the outcome and if i can do that with them then i'm really going to be free then i'm going to be even more free universally once the problem that you solve specifically you solve universally absolutely i think we're so quick to give up on people right if they don't match up to where we are or if we feel just they're not in alignment or they're doing worse off or better off than we are. We're like, oh, I don't need that because it's scary because I, I, I just don't want it. I don't want to look at it. But truth is, is there's, yeah, there's lessons in all of it, right? And, mm-hmm. and especially, I, I think I told you about this one friend that I, I was ready to cut out of my life. And I, I knew that there was still yet a journey for us to go on. And that was the journey of, authenticity and truth and i think if you can bring that in and just be free and brave it takes it takes so much courage right Mm. i feel like that's just the people are not willing to just throw themselves into the fire because Mm -hmm. telling the truth is that scary at least to me yeah like it requires everything that i have in me to check myself and to be like is that really what i mean in this moment is that where i'm going and once you can do that and just dive yeah and 
Yeah, stick stick with those people and use them. And and sometimes the truth and the lesson you need to learn is actual boundary. You know, and like well, that that's too. that's that the thing, right? Like like your truth, the truth could be like Actually, I, you know, I always, I'll love you as you are, but this is you the can boundary. love from afar. This sure. is the boundary, and the boundary is is that I'm not going to allow you to, you know, kind of constantly berate me with your opinions that are, you know, intended from a place that I'm not in accord with, or like trying to hold me constantly, trying to hold me to this. Like, here's the boundary, and the boundary maybe we don't talk. The boundary maybe we don't see each other, but you can still do the internal work behind the boundary. And actually setting the boundary is also another level of work where it's right. like you just have the discretion to know like, no, 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 here's the boundary. This is, I'm not interested in anything beyond this. Absolutely. But my friend, she actually brought this up. I think it was Marion Williamson that said this, but sometimes love says no. Do you know what I mean? And we all think that love means like, yes, I love you. And all. But sometimes I remember, so my, my dad um, has pancreatic cancer and he, um, he was talking about how keto is actually not the way to go because I did a whole month of keto and I trying, you know, I, I saw him eating chocolate cake in the morning and I was just devastated. I was just like, oh, how could he? And I I just wrote this message like, let's do keto together. And his message back was like sending me articles on how keto is bad for you. And I was like, where is he getting this from? <laughs> and I thought, well, I could be nice to him and just say like, sure, whatever. Or I could just say, you know what? I've done my research and this is what I've discovered. And basically I was saying no to what, what he was giving me. And the resp- I thought for sure this would blow up into something. But instead he was like, okay, mm. okay. Because I said no. Yeah. I didn't try to, you know, I, I wasn't willing to just go along. Yeah, you weren't just waffling along no. and pretending like, okay, you know, like maybe you're right. right. And when you actually really know and you've looked at the metabolic theory of cancer and Travis right. Christopherson's research and you <laughs> yeah, really actually I've understand. Read the books and everything uh, yeah. and I'm like, <gasps> but, but his response was growth. That's what came, came from the no. Yeah, it's it's the it's the kindness to give them a true reflection, right? Which that was is actually love. like that was loving. Love. It's loving their higher self, not coddling their ego, right? You know, which is a far different thing. Mm-hmm. All right, we're coming up to the end here. I want you to take people through just one thing. You know, as we did, I know you, we did a list of ten for the for the workshop, but I want you to help people come up with one thing to be grateful for and like how to go through that process and how to celebrate, how to do the whole thing Okay. to help lead people through finding one thing and then becoming grateful for that thing. Well, this one specific practice is almost the basis of all manifestation, right? Um, So you think of this one thing that you truly want in life, whether it be this incredible partner being back to full health, if you're struggling or, you know, achieving a goal or receiving an award so whatever it might be or just feeling a certain living and feeling a certain way absolutely feeling at peace feeling in health in my case feeling in truth and writing it down as if you already are there so for instance if my greatest dream was i would like to be in truth and live in truth I would write it, I am living in truth. And I would write first three times, thank you. And that just reinforces the gratitude. So writing three times, thank you, thank you, thank you, four. Now three is the number of all creation. So there's also that, that's sort of like the magic formula. And just writing Maybe. down. Hmm? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but, you know, that. But either way, write it three times. Write it three times. Trust me, it has worked for me. It'll work for you. And just writing down, I am in truth. I am receiving my award. I have received my award. You can write it also in the past so that it has already happened. And once you're there, you've written it down. You're going to sit with it. And so let's everybody, let's everybody take a moment because <clears throat> maybe you have the luxury right now. You're in a place where you can actually write, the, write this down. And so you would write something. And if I was doing this myself, I would say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for realizing that this latest challenge has been the greatest blessing 
that could have come to me in this moment and has liberated me to a place of even greater freedom and happiness and 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 the release of the anxiety that I was feeling and thank you thank you thank you for this thing right so so that would be my I felt that so that would be my <laughs> yeah yeah so that would be my thing right now and if yeah. you can't write it down you can just say that say that to yourself right now and then right. Maya will lead you through the process from there So now that you have that in mind, you can close your eyes and sit with it, take deep breaths. And you're really going to think about this feeling that you have now that you have what you've desired most. And you're going to feel it in your body, in your belly, in your heart. And it's there. You've done it. You've accomplished it. And you can get excited. I sometimes jump up and down by myself in my living room. I'm like, yes, I did it. And just sit with that and sit with that feeling. And it's extraordinary what you thought was not going to be attainable. You have achieved right in this moment, right now. And so you can sit with that for a moment. And now you're going to think about this one person that you're going to reveal the news to and how you're going to tell them and the face that they're making and your face while you're spilling the news with so much joy and happiness. You might both be in tears of joy together. And this can be to your mother This can be to a friend, a stranger. This can be to a whole group of people. You might be telling the world about this news and just feeling their energy, the love that they have towards you and how excited they are. They might even be more excited than you are about this news because they needed it. And again, just feeling that in your body. You can even talk out loud. You can scream. And then once you have that, I want you to think of the first thing that you will do once you have received this accomplishment. First thing you're going to do. In my case, for instance, when I go through my number one desire, I know that I'm going to eat a giant cheeseburger and fries and I'm going to go to a diner with my parents and my loved ones and we're all going to eat cheeseburgers and fries, extra ketchup. So whatever that place may be, whatever you're doing, really visualize it. It's so important to use imagination and knowing that you're already there. And then feeling it in your heart and giving more gratitude for it than you have for anything you have ever received in your entire life. You know, that's, uh, <clears throat> it's interesting because, you know, no sense, no sense, you know, not expressing what this is, but I just received word that, you know, uh, articles coming out that's really kind of misrepresented me in a, in a way that was, it was painful, felt like a betrayal, yeah. you know, to a certain degree. And um, <clears throat> so it hurts, you know, it hurts. And I think it cuts to like a core wound of being misunderstood and being unseen and then having people you know when I've really really actually done my best and then having being misrepresented and this is something that's everybody so many people deal with right absolutely um and I've dealt with it before but this was just a surprise like surprise you know like we're going to misrepresent you 
And I was like, fucking, you really? Yeah. All right. So, so in me, as we started this practice, and this is something that people might be able to identify with, <clears throat> there is resistance. Totally. There is resistance to feeling gratitude for it. Like, no, don't, don't feel, <laughs> don't feel gratitude for this. Cause this is fucked up, you know, like, <laughs> like don't, don't let yourself do yeah. it. And then as you kind of went through, and by the time we got to the cheeseburgers, I could feel it just start to melt away. Mm. And maybe it's not completely gone. That's why this is a practice, right? This is why you do it every day, of yeah, course. Exactly. So it just started to soften, just yeah. started to kind of, the edges started to soften a little bit. And I started to kind of believe it a little bit. Yeah. And I maybe didn't, in this one time, in this one practice, because it's fresh and because it was last night that I got this news, like it was, I wasn't able to fully get there, but I got, I got a lot closer. You know, I got a lot closer. And so for anybody who's doing this, and as you write your list and you do this, then it's okay if you can't get fully there. 100%. Get as far as you can. I think it would be strange if there were no resistance (laughs) because it's the thing you want most, Mm -hmm. right? We're not asking for, I don't know, a TV set. Yeah. We're we're I want a new pamplemousse. Exactly. (laughs) I think that would be easy. Did I say that right? Well, actually, apparently it's LaCroix. But in French, you would say la croix. But How about pamplemousse? Pamplemousse. <laughs> Ish. I Close enough. <laughs> but um, yes, I think, of course, there's going to be resistance for things that we want the most, that we crave the most. And that's why the practice is so important so that you, I now think about my desires as if I'm already living it. I'm already living the life that I would lead and that I would live if I had all those things into my life. And that's how you can live your life so that you're never craving anything. And it does sort of detach you in a healthy way in that aspect where you can just, you you have no attachment to the outcome because you're already there. You're already living that. And you are living in the present. This is your present. Thanks, Maya. Thank you, love. For everything. Thank you. I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful to you too. I love you. I love you (laughs) so much. All right, everybody, watch Maya on all of her, <laughs> on all of her films and things. And you have, a, you have a cool challenge. I don't know when this podcast will release. It might be over by the time it releases. It but might be. Yeah, I have a self and serve challenge where every day you do one thing in service to yourself. So one self-loving action and a second thing that is in service towards others. So. Cool. So follow you on Instagram. Sure. That'll, that'll be a good way to keep in touch. Yeah, keep in touch with me. I would love to know your progress all of y'all's progress. All y'all's. I know. I was giving my little <laughs> Texan Yeehaw! twang. I know. The Swiss girl. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Much love, everybody. Peace. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe. Also, share with any friend that you think might benefit from it. And lastly, go to AubreyMarcus.com, sign up for my newsletter diary, and you won't miss a thing.